Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about active learning and just jump in anytime. You can keep your, your mic open. Um, we have a short presentation then with a link to a lot of resources, some really good resources. Um, you know, active learning is defined in many ways, but it's basically the opposite of passive learning, which is when students are quietly listening to lectures, which empirically is what students tend to prefer. It's a lot less work just to sit there and pretend to be listening um, and or thinking that you're actively engaged with the material. Um, but with active learning, students are engaged more actively and more cognitively with the course concepts. They have to do something with them. They have to do some, some uh, they have to engage with the course concepts somehow. Um, and active learning activities could be just a few minutes. It could be a simple few minute activity, um, or it could be a entire class session, or it could even be something that runs across multiple class sessions, such as some of the reacting to the past things or some of the simulation exercises where you have multiple days of continuous activities. Uh, some of the reacting to the past sessions, for example, go on for potentially weeks or even a whole semester where students play roles um, where they're role playing about some type of historical event or uh, where they're playing the roles of some of the participants in that uh, and using knowledge they've acquired in their role playing. So why use it? Um, in general, it leads to deeper learning. It's not measured that precisely empirically. But what we generally mean by that is that people are able to remember things long term uh, and that they're able to engage in more transfer, that they can take concepts they've learned in one context and apply them in other contexts more effectively. And there's a lot of research suggesting this. So we get long improved. <laughs> OK, I got a little ahead of the slide. So <laughs> but basically, um, you remember things better and you're able to apply them more effectively when you engage in active learning than if you're just listening passively to something. Um, one of the most important reasons to consider active learning is that it reduces equity gaps, that active learning empirically benefits all students but it especially benefits the students who tend to be left behind. It especially benefits students who are first gen students and students from historically underrepresented groups um, who tend to, it closes the gaps in general when people are actively engaged in class sessions. Um, and it also leads to improved metacognition because students are able not just to actively engage with us, but they have to apply their knowledge and test their knowledge and they get better feedback of what they understand because it's really easy to sit in a lecture, well-organized lecture, and everything makes a lot of sense. Um, and you don't realize the gaps in your understanding until you sit down with some type of an assignment where you sit to write a paper or you take a high stakes exam and then you realize you don't understand it. So um, um, it's, it's helpful to do that. and. By improving metacognition, it also increases your learning. The better you understand what you know and what you don't know, yeah. the more deeply you tend to learn things. Yeah. Maggie? Um, you know, I was just, I don't know if I'll be getting ahead of myself in the slides, um, <laughs> but um, I was, you know, no. thinking about how I talk about active learning with my students. Um, you know, I tell them that, you know, I could sit here and just speak to you, you know, for an entire class period for the entire semester. And it may all sound great and fine. And you might, you know, really enjoy just sitting back and, and letting it happen. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you're actually, um, you're actually gaining anything, it, you know, it, 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 in fact, you know, that when you are engaged, even if it means taking risks and speaking in front of the class, and even if it means, um, you know, trying and um, experiencing, you know, I don't want to say failure, I, I don't know exactly how I, I don't remember how I say it to them. But, you know, even if it means taking some bigger risks, it's also, you know, they're the gains that they're going to get over over time is is going to be just that much more important. So but the point, I think one point of that is it's really important to sell students on this yeah. because in many studies, when students are asked what they think is more effective in their learning, 
they think it's more effective to listen to a lecture from a professor who's an expert on the topic. And they feel that they're being cheated when active learning is used instead, because as they will often say on course evaluations, we had to do all the work. We had to do all the learning ourselves um, as if we could somehow learn for the students, you know, and but it's important to explain to them that this is for them and this is a reason. There's all this research out there and sharing some of that research with them is helpful too in helping them understand why it's done. Now, one of the lowest levels of active learning is interactive lecture where you might throw in occasionally or we might mostly lecture, but break it up a bit by throwing in some think pair share exercises. Those are very simple. They can be used pretty much at any time. Um, you could use polling, again, to break up a lecture. And in both of these, you're getting students to reflect on the material, trying to apply it, and sharing it somehow. And with the polling in particular, you can get feedback on what they're learning. So not only are students learning more about what they know and what they don't understand, we get to see that too, allowing us to do more just-in-time teaching to focus on those issues where students have problems. Another common technique is a memory dump. And a memory dump is, again, if you're mostly doing a lecture, um, which is not uncommon in many large classes, I moved away from it as much as I can, uh, but a memory dump is just periodically, you stop and you ask students to write down everything they remember from the last portion of the class. And then often you ask them to do a think pair share with that, where you ask them to share what they recall and that fills in some of the gaps and it helps, you know, helps make sure that they weren't missing something or they, they hadn't missed something while they were playing a video game on their phones or while they were, you know, checking Instagram or Snapchat. Um, another strategy is collaborative note taking where you break students up into groups and you have um, students jointly share a Google Drive doc, for example, where they all take notes simultaneously, which again is similar to the memory dump, except it's all done at the same time. Um, and people can fill in the gaps where other people miss it. You wouldn't want to do that with very large groups, but it, it can work well if you have a couple of people doing it. Um, and okay, uh, any other? <laughs> um, you know, I was thinking about Socratic, you know, questioning, you know, where you're not just, you mm -hmm. know, speaking, you're, you're also, you know, trying to engage, you know, maybe even just one student or multiple students, you know, throughout a lecture by um, offering them the opportunity to answer a question and, and call on students. Um, you know, I, I would, I would throw that in as an interactive lecture, but, you know, kind of in the It's smallest. less of a lecture. Yeah, it's less more of a... that students come in prepared and then sure. you're yeah. questioning them constantly. That's probably closer to a flip classroom in some ways, yeah, although it predates that term by yeah. several centuries. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, a little bit more interactive is a flip classroom where typically you have some pre-class quizzes. You often use polling in some form. Um, group work on problem sets can often be done um, and so forth. Um, and, you know, these, in this case, you've got a bit more active engagement in work. And I do pretty much all of these things in my classes. Um, you know, and the group work on problem sets mm -hmm. can be really helpful because you do have that peer discussion and peer mm -hmm. feedback and peer explanation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think, um using social annotation is, is mm -hmm. also a good example of this where, you know, if you want students to be prepared for a classroom discussion about a reading that you're engaged or that you've assigned, um, I like to assign them to annotate those readings prior to coming to the class. And they do, there is a little pushback because they, you know, usually want more time. But I, I try to combat some of that by you know, sending them a reminder like a few days in advance so that they're they're not um, falling behind on on the reading. But, you know, then I like to take, you know, some of those comments and some of the questions that have come up during the class or during um, that, annotation. that annotations and then bring them into the classroom and say, hey, this student brought up a really interesting point. What do you all think about it? And then structure discussions around that. Yeah, that's a really good technique. It it's 
it can scale because now you do have the ability to break up into groups. It's a little harder to do grading on that if you have if classes you have of hundreds. Class, but, sure, um, but but I do that in my um, my capstone course where students do, and it, each week they take turns in small groups presenting papers and they annotate it in between, and that again leads to a much richer discussion than when I used to have them work with discussion forums. Because with a discussion forum, it's really easy for people to look at the title of a paper and not necessarily read it and just throw in some comments that are not terribly informed. Mm -hmm. But when they're right in the middle of the document and annotating specific blocks of yeah. text, they tend to read things much more, well, they're kind of forced to at least yeah. do some reading and it leads to much more engagement with the document and more close reading. And some good discussions often take place mm -hmm. in there. Um, so again, peer instruction and cooperative learning is another way, another way of doing this. Um, and this looks awfully um, similar. Um, this, I'm not sure where this slide came from. This yeah, looks, I don't know. I, I should have looked at this. It, we might have carried uh, over from the other slide. Well, except we had talked about this and I'm trying to- Role playing though, it seems new. Well, okay. Well, let's back off from the role playing for just a second. This is actually kind of what I've been doing in my kind of metrics class, where I do have students read, watch videos and do some quizzes, quizzes embedded in the videos themselves, videos that I created. I do polling with them, but much of the class period, they're working on problem sets and they're explaining things to each other. So there's a lot of cooperative mm -hmm. learning, but we kind of had that part on the last slide. Role playing is another thing that could be done We've got to clean up this slide. Uh, I, I should have looked at this more carefully. This we had done in January and um, so forth. But other types of active learning and cooperative. Oh, maybe with the polling, it might refer to the way in which Eric Mazur suggests we do polling, which many of us do here, mm -hmm. where you ask students a challenging question um, that where there is a correct answer, mm -hmm. um, but where it's likely that about half the class will get it wrong, then you have them work together on it and come up with a solution and explain it to each other and then uh, vote again. Um, that may have, I, that's probably why we included it here, although it seemed awfully redundant when we looked at it this way. Role playing can be really effective. I haven't used it in my classes. I mentioned earlier the reaction to the past mm -hmm. uh, thing. There's a lot of pre-existing materials that have been created uh, and shared online where you can get a whole set of instructions for running uh, role-playing activities. They're available in many disciplines for many historical periods and they have various lengths and that's all in the materials that are, are shared. Class debates can be interesting uh, and there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can have um, break them up into small groups and do it with small groups or small groups. Or you could break um, things up into maybe three or four groups where the people are assigned different corners of the room and they each and they debate with the other three groups in some way. And there's lots of examples we'll share shortly. Um, there's some role play or game activities, um, gamification type activities that can be used. Um, and Two stage exams is one of my favorite activities. I really like um, it too. And with a two stage exam, what happens is you administer an exam uh, to the whole class. Uh, and if you have a long enough class period, maybe two thirds or so of the time is devoted to individual exams. And then you break the students up into small groups and they take the exam again as a small group and they submit a group version of the exam after they've had a chance to go through it themselves. That could either be the entire exam or it could be a subset of the questions or they could be equivalent questions that are not identical. Um, what I've generally done, because I was generally teaching a class where I use this in 50 minute time blocks, is I had students take the exam one day and the next class period, uh, between that and the next class period, I would grade their exams so I could see how they did. And if, if 95% of the class or 90% of the class did well on a question, there's no sense in asking them to do it again. Uh, but often I ended up giving them the same exam again. And what would happen basically is they'd get together and go over it. And, you know, and the alternative to that was 
I'd give an exam, I'd come back to the next class, I'd give it back, and we'd go through it as a whole group. And the students who did well would be really happy and wouldn't pay a lot of attention because they did well. The students who didn't do so well were kind of upset about their low grades and they just tended to zone out, just feeling disappointed and upset that they did so poorly. But when we did the second stage, it took less time than going over the whole exam as a class because they could explain things to each other. And, you know, I remember one conversation the first time I did it, someone said, well, I don't remember um, us ever covering this. And then another student said, well, remember when we work with that data set where we were, you know, where we were addressing a correction for heteroscedasticity and we used this technique. And it was just so nice to hear that where students were reminding each other of when they learned it. And then the other student who was kind of upset saying, I don't remember ever discussing this said, oh yeah. <laughs> and hearing it from other students was much more effective than, you know, for me to try to address that. And it was just such a positive activity. They were all actively engaged in discussing things, reminding each other of concepts. And it was actually a lot of fun, which tended not to be true with most exam reviews in the past. Lots of options for collaborative projects. Project-based learning is where you assign, assign um, some type of project, typically a community-based project. Um, they're available, or you can come up with them in almost any discipline. I know we have a group on campus that helps to support uh, community-based learning, um, experiential learning, but it hasn't been as active now as it was a few years ago. I think COVID kind of shut a lot of that down. But, you know, in many disciplines, there's a lots of things you can, lots of projects that you could take on in the community, working with homeless shelters, working with food bank, um, but food banks working with, you know, non-governmental organizations of various types, or just, you know, I, there was one case where people built a playground for children and so forth, um, you know, and they can learn some interesting skills from some of those activities. Mm -hmm. Open pedagogy is where students are creating learning materials rather than just consuming it. Um, video projects could work. They could write books or chapters or essays that are going to be published online. They could do podcasts or something similar. Um, student presentations, which we often have them do, might be replaced by poster sessions. I switched from you know, student PowerPoint presentations to poster sessions, and they were just so much more fun. And students would spend the whole class explaining their research projects rather than a 10 minute presentation while they sat around anxious the rest, the rest of the time waiting for their turn to be up there presenting. You know, and instead they spent the whole class period explaining it to other students in the class. Um, so um, any other comments on any of this, sorry. Um, you know, I, um, you know I've, I've thought about doing some collaborative like writing in um in my class and so i i attempted some of that in um in a class i taught this semester where i had students do like a little bit of a speed dating exercise where they would sit across from each other explain the paper that they had um had summarized and analyzed and then they worked to find you know, who in the class had overlap and similar findings and then work together in a, you know, Google Doc to then create a, essentially a literature review, but one that was a little more synthesized than what they typically, um, you know, churn out in, in their assignments. I know that a lot of us, um, you know, get, um, get papers where, you know, it's one study said this, next study said this, and there's no real attempt at identifying patterns and, um, in the ways that certain research had built off of previous research, but this was kind of a, it was a cool way to get the entire class involved in one class period. And I assigned, you know, those um, particular articles um, so that I, I kind of had some understanding of what they were going to be reviewing. But, um, you know, so there's, I think, a lot of opportunities to really get students talking with each other and, you know, working together to create something, um, create something together. So. Okay, so uh, there was a question on how do I, how long do you have them present a poster for a poster session? Depending on the size of the class, <laughs> if I generally divide the class, 
if this class was reasonable size of like 30 students or so, um, 30 or more, I generally break the session up into two days with half the class presenting one day and the other half presenting the other day. I uh, generally invited people from my department down. So what would happen is I'd bring a, some um, painter's tape uh, and I gave out poster boards to them. Uh, and they these were low quality posters. Let me rephrase that. They were posters that were inexpensive posters. So I gave them the poster boards. I had them print things up and basically glue or tape the materials to it. So this was not a very fancy poster session because even if they were to print it on campus, it would cost something like $30 or more for each yeah. poster. And that just, they're using a free textbook, you know, and I wanted to keep it inexpensive so basically i gave them a poster board about a week or so before the posters were due uh, they were just finishing up their projects uh, and half the class would be up there presenting and the other half would be going around asking questions as well as usually some colleague from the department a couple of times the dean came by um, actually partly because our previous dean's son uh, husband was in the class so uh, so she came by a couple of times just one semester uh, just to see how it went uh, and then I did it in the classroom so some of them were on the side wall and some were on the whiteboard up front um, and so I'd have the people on one wall go and chat with the people on the other wall so they got to see mm -hmm. what those were and or if most of them were pr presentations with two or more people occasionally someone wanted to work on their own and if there were two people one of them could just go around and chat with the others and so forth and then the next class day it flipped so half of them were observing and discussing while the other half were presenting so does that answer your question okay um and in terms of other projects i've for I think now six or seven years, my capstone class has written a book project. Uh, they just completed one on economic, the economics of crises. Uh, last year, they did a podcast series, uh, which was fairly good. And I've also used podcast things now, and I think, I think now nine different classes where they've created podcasts um, in introductory classes, labor economics classes, or in our capstone project, in addition to a bunch of other things, other activities. Um, so that's all worked pretty well. Um, and they have a lot of fun with that. It's much, and one of the things that students really appreciated with the open pedagogy projects is they had something with the podcast or the book that they could share with their parents, with their relatives, um, or with their friends, or with potential employers. A lot of them ended up posting links to the things they created on their LinkedIn profile so they could share those as part of their applications. Um, and um, and some of them, when they were working on um, some project, they shared them with the grad school applications just as some evidence of what they've learned in their classes. Um, and here's a bunch of other resources. Um, if you want to just take a picture of that, it should um, aim your camera at that. It would give you, um, it should open the link. Um, let me actually, let me just drop it into chat too which may be more efficient. Um, and let me go back here. There we go. And the chat is on this other screen. I am tired today. Um, there we go. There, okay. So this is actually probably the most valuable thing we can share. Uh, we've got a lot of resource, resources here. Um, the first is a series of meta-analyses, which are studies of studies that involve hundreds of thousands of students in one form or another on the benefits of um, active learning. Uh, one of the biggest ones was the one that was done by the, um, where was it? Um, oh, I'm, thinking of, I'm thinking of a different one. Um, there was one that was done by the Department of Education a while back where they were, that was actually more of a comparison of synchronous courses, hybrid, or asynchronous, face-to-face, -face, and hybrid classes. But these are just studies primarily of active learning. And, you know, this, there was a recent study that came out that criticized the methodology of many of these studies and that they were not randomly controlled, randomized experiments or other things, but I have read hundreds of studies on active learning 
And they all suggest that students learn at least as much in active learning as they do in more passive approaches. And I've never seen the opposite show up in any study. Um, so while the, since many of the people doing the research are not necessarily highly skilled empirical researchers, some of that research may be a bit flawed, but the, the overwhelming consensus of the evidence is that active learning leads to more learning and it especially benefits students who tend to, in general, be left behind. So the, the evidence is really overwhelming. And um, here's some really good resources on this. Cornell, um, this is a good book if you happen to you know, run across it, Student Engagement Techniques, a bunch of active learning activities that Clara Major and Elizabeth Barkley put together. Um, although many of them actually show up in the Cape Patricia Cross Academy. Cornell has a great discussion and a set of techniques on this, but I wanna to go to this one because this I think is one of the best resources out it's there. It's really good. It's, it's just amazing. And it's expanded during the, originally they were mostly done for face-to-face -face classes, but during the pandemic, they were sitting around with some video cameras and they decided <laughs> they were going to double the number of activities so that for each one, they each face-to-face -face activity, they came up with something equivalent for an asynchronous activity. And you can either search it by techniques or you can do it by the cross currents library. Let's, let's look at the techniques library. Um, and each of these, is described really simply. Um, and let's, let's just pick one. Let's say uh, a digital story. It's the first one, so we'll look at it. And what happens is there's a little video describing it. Most of the videos are five to 10 minutes long. Um, and then they have instructor's guides on how to use it. There's a, um, an online adaptation of it to talk about how to do it when you're teaching an asynchronous online class. Um, and then they have everything classified here by the type of activity, by these keywords, by the teaching problem that it solves, um, and also by the various types of learning taxonomy. Um, basically, you know, Bloom's taxonomy and whether it's foundational or higher level knowledge and so forth. Um, and it's, it's just an incredible resource. Um, and the instructor's guide contains pretty much everything you need in order to be able to apply the technique. Sometimes they have handouts that you can use or modify. Um, and apparently this is all in a zip file, which is convenient. Um, but let's see where it went. Oh, where did it go? Oh, it, it went to the other screen. Let me bring this over. Uh, the, that's not it. Um, where did it go? Um, it opened up on my screen. Um, one more time, it should be in here. And when I drag that over, there we go. <clears throat> so here are just some, some documents that you can use it. Apparently they did this on a Mac, but um, here's an updated version in 2021. Um, and let's just pick one of these PDFs. Windows cannot create this. I guess you have to unzip it first in order to do something with this one. Well, that's kind of surprising. But in any case, <laughs> most of these things work. This is the first time I've tried one of these without it working. And um, let's go back there. I closed that out, I think. And with the cross currents library, it lets you search for specific topics. So we can go here. There we go. And here you can search by hmm. Oh, this is like a blog. Okay. I'm sorry. You can also search by those things, but not there. The cross country currents library is just some good blog posts by the two creators of this. Um, and they did this in honor of K. Patricia Cross. Um, Patricia Cross actually was one of the developers of 
classroom assessment techniques, things like the one minute quiz, the muddiest point and all those things collected together uh, in a classic book. And she was ill and, um, and Claire Majors and, um, and Elizabeth Barclay put together this site in honor of her to celebrate all of her contributions. Um, and they also wrote a book um, that the book that was mentioned above in that list was um, all the proceeds of that book goes to support this resource actually. And apparently now it's available over a hundred different languages. Uh, and here is where you do the searching. So you can, um, oh, that's a book. Okay, here's a filter technique. That's what I was looking for. You can filter it by the teaching environment, whether you're looking at face-to-face, -face, synchronous or hybrid. You can, you can search it by the activity type and these are the different activity types. And you notice they've got quite a few, uh, certainly just active learning broadly is 39, but they've got quite a few other um, categories here in term, including learning assessment, reciprocal teaching, reflection, um, reflection activities, and then you could toggle, scroll through all of them, um, or you could um, search it by the teaching problem address, which would be, um, academic dishonesty, cheating, insufficient class preparation, lack of participation, low in motivation engagement, poor attention listening, poor note taking, or surface learning. And I think we can probably all think of some experiences we may have had over time, particularly since the pandemic, with some of those, those things. Um, and these are designed specifically perhaps to help address some of those things. And then the learning taxonomy um, these are the categories that they use. So it's just an incredible resource. So I'd encourage you to look through it. And both Elizabeth Barkley and Claire Major come up with some really simple ways of implementing this. And again, they give you all the tools and instructions and guidance and tips and so forth, as long as you can open the zip file. Um, so. So now, um, well, I suppose we should just look at the last of the resources, but that's the one I recommend the most. Um, here's where you could find reacting to the past episodes. Um, here's another set of active learning techniques. Um, there's some podcasts we've done on this. We've got a new one coming up actually in a few weeks uh, on July 9th um, about the active learning initiative at the University of Georgia. Uh, they've devoted millions of dollars to this and they've, they've both done it with teacher training. One of the interesting things about UGA's approach is not only have they been working on teaching faculty how to use active learning, they also provide an orientation as part of their first year course for students on teaching students about the benefits of active learning so that all students come in recognizing that active learning is beneficial so you don't have that sort of resistance that we often see when, when instructors try applying active learning techniques and students get upset that you're not teaching me because students are trained. Some of the money also went for infrastructure to redesign their classrooms so that the classes were better set up for active learning. And one of the things they've done is uh, when at the closing keynote at CIT, Derek Bruff asked people to list some of their favorite active learning techniques, uh, and then he showed his, uh, and it was a picture of a chair with wheels, <laughs> which was one of the major innovations that allow students not to be locked into rigid positions. Um, but, but so at University of Georgia, they're investing millions in active learning over a five-year period, which is really impressive. Um, and there's some podcasts too that we've talked about this. Uh, and here's a study, a classic study of um, student resistance. Uh, I believe this was done, if I remember, at Harvard, where students were asked about whether how much they learned in an active learning classroom and how much they felt they learned in lecture classes. 
The classes were evaluated concerning how much lecture was used and how much active learning activities were used. And then they measured actual learning in those classes because many of these classes were multiple section courses. Uh, and what they found was that in general, students learned significantly more on average when they were in active learning classes, but they perceived that they learned less in those classes compared to the alternative of lecture classes. So students believe lecture is more effective on average, even at Harvard, um, where you know maybe they might be able to pick up on some of this stuff a little more quickly, um, but that's not the perception. Um, so, and it does look like something did load, a PDF did it ultimately load somewhere. Oh, and here it is, it did pop up. Um, I don't know why we had that error before, but There we go. Here we go. So, um, so here's the document, um, an instructor's guide to the activity. And let me move that over a bit. So um, in any case, it will take you through, and this was the first one on that list, I forgot what it actually was, uh, digital stories. And it addresses the overview initially, and then it provides you, you know, with a process of implementing it basically. And cool. it's really well done. They put a tremendous amount of work into this and Claire Major, I think did more of it. And she's just an incredibly detail oriented person who does a remarkable job with this. And she's, she's come out with so many great books. So, um, so that's what we've got to share. Now, are there any active learning techniques that you especially like? Me, me, me. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I've got one I really like, but um, but I get frustrated with the materials because they don't age very well. I have to replace them all the time. So I use these um there, I purchased these pre-printed, you probably know all about them, the um uh, immediate feedback um assessment technique quizzes. They're the just, fat ones. Yeah, the scratch off ones, yeah. I love them, the scratch off ones. The students love them, I love them. Um, I mean, it works best, of course, when you write the questions such that they have to really discuss the questions, right? Um, and the best questions in my experience are, are ones where like there's more than one possible right answer and the idea is to get to the best answer, right? And then you scratch it off and you find out right away if you were right or not. Um, and then if you weren't, of course, right, you can go back and, and reconsider your other options and, and scratch them off for partial credit and everything until you get the right one. Oh my God, I love it so much. Um, but John, I don't know if you've ever had any of these things in the office after, a, after like they come in huge batches and then, you know, after about two years, they don't scratch off very nicely anymore. And it actually gets frustrating. Um, and I need to go buy a new batch even now. Um, but I don't know if you have that on your list anywhere as, um, we, we don't, they are a great tool and they're part of team-based learning. In fact, the, the trademark team-based learning uh, term um, where there's a whole set of procedures you're supposed to do, but, but, that, but those really are a lot of fun. And I, if I Love remember it. correctly, a common use of that is if students only selected one answer, they get more points. If they had scratched off two of them before sure. they found it was correct, then they get lower points and so forth and okay. it's, a, it's a really fun system that students really enjoy um the for a while those those cards had disappeared because they um the the one company that produced them went out of business but then others have sprung up about a year and a half or two years ago so you can now get them again do you have a favorite company? Because I really do need to reorder another batch now. I don't. I've never used them. I, I generally do things electronically. So, you know, um, mm -hmm. and there are some electronic tools available for that, although I haven't used those either. But, um, oh, but yeah, I, I like the tactile. Uh, but you're right. The students have to move around. They have to get into a group. Um, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. On posters, you know, I do a poster presentation in my intro class every, every semester. Um, and our posters are only, cl they're closer to $15 to get printed professionally at the Port City okay. Copy Center. Yeah, but there's the tricky thing there is uh, when actually the Port City Copy Center is really fast on their turnaround in my experience, but I find the tricky thing to be the, the timing of it, right? I do want to give um, the Copy Center enough time to print the posters. And so the students have to turn them in well in advance. We print them, then we host our symposium. Um, and sometimes, especially in the fall with the Thanksgiving break, uh, the timing, the timing is sometimes not awesome. 
Yeah, I had looked just at the prices on campus, and that was a couple of years ago, and then it was like thirty or forty dollars or so. Oh, know. and they can be, and and we do right. That's it's a it's a it's only highlight color. We use a certain quality paper. I pre-negotiate with the the copy center, but they've been very wonderful to work with. I have the students email them their posters directly as a PDF. Um, and then they go there, you know, as sort of a professionalization communication exercise too. The students are responsibilized to discuss any um, any edits that they have to make, right? Sometimes inevitably out of a class of a hundred students and we're doing 20 posters, inevitably two of them are gonna send a poster to the to the printers that has too much color, right? Or too much, like it's outside of our bounds of what we can print. Um, and they and um, they communicate directly with the printers to to make their revisions and resubmit them in a timely fashion, and it's it's really been great. Nice uh, local company. Well, I may have to reconsider that then because that would be nicer than than just the taped on pages. But <laughs> well, that's but exciting. Even that, they're so, happy with it, you know, collage so. sort of way. Uh, you yeah. know. Ms. Hawk and I, though, we 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 might be hatching a plan to sort of put in a grant to buy our own large format printer. Maybe to live in the library and be, uh, you know, because it is still an expense, right? E even at fifteen dollars a poster, it is still it is still an expense that it might be nicer to have in house. Yeah, there um, they we do have some on campus, but they tend to be owned by the um, art department and by the technology department, and I generally haven't seen. Them. Yeah, a lot of sharing of those, but I don't know how many people have asked to be fair. I I feel like we had someone in our department use the tech department's um, printer, but I think they had to pay for like, you know, out of the department budget to, you know, print, but I, I don't know how that all actually shook out. I know, and I and I shouldn't speak out of turn. I don't know really what Candace's plans are, but um, but I'm hoping that the the that you know for her digital humanities lab and everything. But I'm sort of hoping that we we it could, would be nice. Yeah, you know, you know, and certainly you still have to pay for materials, of course. Um, but I think it would be wonderful to have students have that opportunity or have that have that resource more available to them on campus. Certainly for Quest um, and for this collab, you know, for for more collaborative exercises in class, it'd be great. Yeah. Excellent. Those are, well, that's a great activity. And um, and yeah, the scratch off things. Uh, I have AP, which stands for what? Um, oh, it's it's instant feedback assessment yeah. technique. Assessment right? technique, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, which, but I but I don't like and and I I do use them for quizzes and exams and things. Um, uh, you know, because I sort of want like I I hate the idea just personally. I hate the idea of of spending classroom time on assessment. I know it's required, I know it's important, but I want every moment of classroom time to be learning time. I really, like I just really do. Um, and so in a world where you can sort of trick them into still conversing with each other, teaching each other things as they're being assessed, it, you know, if, if it is, you know, an actual quiz score and everything. Um, that's how, I, that's actually how I came to it was I was loath to, to give up class time to an exam. And one of my colleagues, a former colleague in my department, adopted team-based learning along with those parts as part of it. And one of the things he noted was that it led to positive peer pressure on attendance yes. because people didn't want to let their team down because if people were not showing up, their teammates would, would kind of get on them a little bit saying, we really needed you here last time because we got a lot of things wrong that you could have helped us with. And that's kind of a nice positive yeah, feedback to, nice. you know. Oh, I couldn't pressure. agree more. Yeah, I and agree. also for students to come prepare to class. Yes, um, and I've had students who, who are, are so sort of anti-group work and even the idea of group work that I, that I suspect them to have just like purposefully missed the group exam day. Um, and then they'll and then they'll come to my office and I'll give them the same exam and the same scratch off form and everything and they do it alone. They never score as well as they do in a group together, actually. And once once that happens a few times and word gets out, um, those are those are my best attended days. It's true. <laughs> it's true. And in general, what yeah, and also the group score is it's sort of like a two stage exam as it's often implemented, and the group score is virtually always higher than the individual score. It turns out we are all of us better together. Yeah. All of us. And that's not a bad message for students to take away. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. No, thank you for the presentation and the and the resources today. They're they're quite wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. The 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 
Kate Patricia Cross Academy is just an amazing resource. I'm so I have to leave early. I'm so sorry. Um, but again, thank you so much for those. Okay. Thank well, thank you. Bye. Elizabeth, any questions or comments or thoughts? No, I'd just kind of like to come and I think I go over the top with active learning, right? You know, I, th you know, and I think I probably throw too much at my students, but I, to me, it's exciting. Like it's exciting to try something new. And so I'm always trying to log on and just, you know, get something, you know, steal something from you that I can take, uh, take with me for the next semester and uh, maybe, or now it's at a place where I have to replace something else. So. <laughs> because that's really, I, I do very little, you know, passive learning and everything is, I make them do it. So I'm not sure if they love me or hate me for it, but it keeps them moving. Class flies by and, you know, they have great products in, at the end of the semester. So, and, and, they and, I love it, so. <laughs> and I'm motivated to be there every day as well. So, nice. um, but no, thank you for this resource tool. So I just saved this in my, in my, uh, PD folder here so I can reference this to swap some stuff out. So thank you. And there's a new book coming out on classroom assessment techniques, an upgrade to the old Angelo and Cross um, book, which that's the Kate Patricia Cross. She died this past year, actually. Oh, um, wow. But her place on that has been taken over by Todd Zakrizek on this book. So it was Tom Angelo and Todd. Um, we'll be talking to them on the podcast in a couple of weeks, but um, the new version of it has act short active learning techniques uh, of the same nature as the old classroom assessment techniques, but some of them involve artificial intelligence. So they've been modernized a little bit to work with AI systems. So I'm looking forward to that book coming out. Absolutely. I've been sneaking into a lot of those AI sessions too. Uh, so it's been really fun kind of seeing the mer like how I merged those two pieces because I definitely we use a ton of AI in our classroom. So I've been Great. really appreciative of these of these sessions. So thank you, thank you both for for being here and, and doing this. Oh well, thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, guys. Yep, you too. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Well, that that was a.